Okay, um, my name's Bill Morris. I'm, as it says up there, the Rolls Royce Trent 900 Assistant Life Cycle Engineer. And I guess part of the clue in uh, how we've changed is the fact that somebody has a job title that includes Life Cycle Engineer. So, uh, and for those who are wondering, the Trent 900 engine is what powers the A380, the Airbus's super jumbo. So, Rolls Royce, well, Rolls-Royce declares its um, vision to provide better power for a changing world. Um, committed to working at the forefront of science and uh, technology to meet the demands of our fast-changing world through understanding our customers, through innovation, to give profitable growth, which I guess they're, they're probably things that um, most uh, industries and certainly high-tech industries relate to. Rolls-Royce itself is a company of a buyout 38,000 um, people, and about half of which are engineers. So if you're wondering where the engineers are, we, we're employing a lot of them. Um, so we have an annual uh, revenue in just over uh, 10 billion pounds um, across four sectors, including marine, and, um, energy, defense, and uh, civil aerospace. Our marine sector has a, a, a four billion pound order book, and revenues in excess of uh, two billion pounds per year, of which 40% come from services. It's, but I'm not going to talk about the marine in, um, sector, I'm, I'm going to talk about civil aerospace, which is where, where I come from. So um, civil aerospace has an uh, annual revenue of about six and a half billion pounds, and 55% of that is directly uh, derived from the uh, services that, that we offer. And I should, should put in at this point in um, time, Rolls-Royce don't make cars. All the cars that say Rolls-Royce are not made by Rolls-Royce. So, in case anyone's wondering. So, services. I guess the questions, why, why did Rolls-Royce go down this, uh, this route? And uh, if I'm frank, I'll say our business model well, is dying. Some would say it is dead. Our traditional business model killed us once. We went bankrupt in 1972, I think it was. Um, fundamentally, our business model has so much risk in it that um, when it goes wrong, it will take down our company. Um, so really, from our perspective, whilst it took us 20 years to be at a point where both ourselves and I guess the um, industry itself was ready to servitize. Um, we've made that change and it's put us in a much better position. And so um, in, in terms of some of the sort of real, real um, blunt business statistics, when I joined the company um, 15 years ago, we uh, typically operated um, with, a, with a working debt measured in um, sort of half a billion pounds, sort of six, seven hundred million pounds. Um, today, that's reversed, so we typically um, hold um, cash or near cash assets measured in about 700 million to a billion, depending if there are any extraordinary things that we're doing. So clearly changing that cash position, and, um, even at the top level, you can appreciate the sort of fiscal squeeze that um, has played out across the world uh, since um, 2008. That didn't hurt us in the same way as it would have done 10, 15 years previously. We've moved on from that, and a key part of that is the, our service offerings. Our, our traditional um, service, um, or um, not service model, our time and material model, as we call it, um, we would typically spend seven or eight hundred million getting a product to market. And that's just development costs. We would then sell the product, probably at cost if we were lucky, quite often at a, at a small loss. We would then wait for four or five years for the engine to go out there and run. And um, then after five years of being in service, the first engine we'd expect to see back in, uh, back in the shop being repaired and we would then sell things at a profit. So where we perhaps spent our, our money 10 years previously, employed a lot of people, we had a massive lag 
before we actually started feeling some of the uh, money coming in. And our <coughs> model has fundamentally shifted. We brought a lot more cash forward, we brought revenue forward, we brought profit forward, and, um, and again, at the sort of very coarse um, top level for our business, we've gone from where our share price was around three pounds, and um, it's now trading at about 12 pounds, so clearly the, uh, the sort of uh, the hard-nosed businessmen in the uh, city of London recognize that we've, we've changed. Um, I wouldn't say service is the only thing that's done that, but that's been a, a real, really instrumental in uh, taking us um, forward as, as a company. So, if I move on, Total Care is our, uh, is our brand for our, um, for our service offering. So, um, it's really um, intended to um, cover a range of services. It, it, um, it's tailored to individual um, operators and it, it's really um, intended to cover all aspects of asset management so no longer are we selling you just an engine we're talking about asset management in support of our civil aerospace products so part of our message of building on rolls royce leading knowledge and experience of of engines we have a larger we can t larger infrastructure that we can take benefit of um, some of our services are talking about predictive maintenance, um, logistics management, and so some of the um, smaller parts of the engine may be costing only only half a million pounds. And how ma how many of those assets do you want to sprinkle around the world if you you've got a limited size fleet? Well, actually, you can buy our service and you buy access to a pool which obviously get you, you start buying into the economies of scale. Um, as well as um, that sort of logistics um, things, um, we talk about um, the, the, the concentration of money is all around the repair and overhaul of um, engines. And if I, the, the real, really simplistic way of describing that total care model is basically you pay me a, a fixed amount for every the, um, dollar, the, oh, sorry, every hour you fly and you, you pay me every month so I'm starting receiving money as soon as you um, start flying that, that engine and when it comes in, in for um, an overhaul it's on us so you may have been slowly contributing towards your overhaul for the last four or, or five years and when that happens it's at our um, cost and one of the key, key aspects of that is um, that it starts to remove some of the uncertainties is um, from engine management for an airline. The, the engine should be a black box, they don't want experts in, in engines they, and they just want to know how much it's going to cost them and they, they are now aligned, their, their cost of owning the engine is aligned with their revenue of people like you and me flying around the world. So immediately we're in alignment with their revenue stream and um, so, some of the um, key changes is their operational reliability, i.e. is the engine going to work, is no longer at their cost, it's at our cost. So we, we've um, aligned our business relationship where previously I made money when your engine broke and came off wing and uh, now I want to keep it on wing in a non-disruptive way. So who um, naturally there's less conflict in our relationship. They understand we, we want disruption free EM flying and that's what they want too. So um, I guess the other, the other element in terms of um, the um, business perspective is um, an engine. If anybody wants to buy one today, will cost you of the order of 8 million, 12 million, depending who you are, how many you want. Um, but um, the life cycle of the um, product, typically we would um, expect to overhaul that six or seven times in the whole life cycle, uh, probably only four million pounds ago. So we're already talking about three or four times the value of the original equipment um, supply through the life cycle of the, uh, of the engine. So we want, to, we want some of that opportunity. We want a lot more of it in our business and less of it in other people's businesses. So, total care. 85% of the top 20 airlines in the world have selected total care. 
and the um, three unfortunate airlines who don't have the benefit of this and um, don't currently uh, fly Rolls-Royce Trent engines, so that's their, ex their excuse. And one of them is uh, currently in uh, negotiations as they have taken Rolls-Royce engines and will be flying them in the uh, future. And I guess the question, how, how, did, how did we get to this uh, position? 90% of Trent-powered aircraft are supported by Total Care. So Trent engines are the um, large engines that, that um, basically any aircraft that's entered service since 1994 has a, uh, that has Rolls-Royce engines, has a Trent engine on it. And if you um, fly um, things like um, the Airbus A340, the Airbus A330, the Airbus A380, they all have a, a Trent engine scale to fit that particular application. Similarly, Boeing isn't immune from us either. If you fly a, uh, a Boeing 777, that may well be Trent um, 800 powered. And if you fly I on the, uh, I guess the brand new um, Boeing 787, yeah, you may well be flying on with a um, Trent 1000 powered um, engine. So Trent is really our modern, our latest generation of, um, of aircraft engines. So 90% of the Trent powered people have a total care contract covering them. So how did we get here? Okay, this, this is a particularly powerful statistic. 100% of total care customers have come back again. So once you've bought it once, 100% of the time so far, people have bought it when they've bought another, another um, tranche of engines from us. So it's clearly something, a service that um, our customers like, something they've bought into. And I guess fundamentally this, this didn't happen overnight. We didn't, we didn't say, oh, I've got a good idea. We'll have uh, total care. And the next day starts, well, in fairness, we probably did start selling it. We just didn't understand what it meant to us and how, how to implement it um, effectively. So really um, it's taken us probably about 20 years to get to where we are today. So. If, if I had been stood here 15 years ago, my presentation would have probably have been on one of those. And uh, I'll say perhaps, perhaps uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I might have brought in a, uh, one of those in a suitcase, you know, big, bulky. Um, what, what, what's tomorrow's uh, presentation gonna look like? Are, are you all gonna be holding iPads with my presentation on it and you're scribbling directly um, on them. Our, our, our perspective of what and our requirements for what's acceptable for um, presentations has changed now. Our business and I guess your business is uh, no different. So if I go back in time, say expectations. The, the jumbo jet, the 747, what, what did people really expect? Well, safety, and that was about it. it. People just accepted the fact that delays, cancellations, disruption was acceptable. We fixed problems when people shouted at us loudly enough. Um, we'd slowly get around to fixing them over the course of time. I don't think there are any customers in here, but that, we, we took their problem seriously, obviously. As things moved on, we moved into the uh, Boeing 777 and the, a, the Airbus A330. Things, things changed. Expectations have moved on markedly. So no longer was that, that acceptable. Things like um, in-flight shutdowns became really quite critical to us, not least because those aircraft only have two engines, so if one of them is shut down or shuts itself down in flight, people start getting pretty nervous about that. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of pulling over when you're midway over the Atlantic makes people pretty nervous. But nonetheless, we, we measured ourselves in, in rates of shutdown. We said, 
Two, two events per 100,000 flying hours is acceptable. The industry accepted that. That, that's, that, that drove us to be a bit, a bit sharper in um, taking some of the problems. Events had to be contained, so you know, let's, let's have less repeat events. You, know? you don't need too many clues to what's, what's um, breaking in your engine and, and having those kind of um, events. And our, our um, reactions had to be that, that much quicker. <coughs> we, we move on. And, um, and uh, the A340 he went, went into service and operators started operating a lot further apart and uh, until recently I think the A340 was flying the longest commercial route in the world which will take you from Singapore to um, New York which sounds hellish to me at something like 17 or 18 um, hours um, and what, what that really meant to the um, airline industry was I spend a lot more time away from home base, a lot further uh, away than I've perhaps been before, and my network is a lot more thinly spread around the world. So actually, if I have some level of disruption, say in, uh, in New York, if I'm Singapore Airlines, that is really problematic for me. I can't get there quickly. I can't possibly have enough assets in New York to manage my fleet when the disruption happens. So really the industry yeah, stepped up and said, yeah, no remote issues. I can't manage having an event in New York when I'm based in Singapore. My business doesn't work. And actually that's really a premium, premium route for me. I fly businessmen that, that route. They are people who give me the most money per seat. They won't accept a level of disruption. So oh, they're expected to step up, we're expected to step up. But things don't stand still. When we talk about the, um, um, my own A380, disruption on those quite often makes the news for all the wrong reasons. And indeed, the um, 787, um, certainly um, in the press um, back home, you don't need to do anything other than cancel a flight and you, you'll get a mention in the press. And from my perspective, it, you rarely see Rolls Royce's name, but um, of course the, the operator flying that engine is really super sensitive to that. It's something beyond their control and they're getting all the negative publicity and, and perhaps you as a consumer to them thinking, well, yeah, reinforcing a, a, a potentially bad and, uh, message. So clearly we feel a lot of pressure as soon as they hit the headlines and that's been a consistent message from our, from our customers. Making the headlines when it's our fault is unacceptable to them. I guess that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Okay, so I'd say really for the last decade we, we've probably been at the forefront of developing and providing what should be a, a comprehensive service packaging for managing engines. So throughout the life cycle, see, and that there was a positive business decision in the early 1990s to say actually our operating model isn't working for us. We need to do something different. We need to approach our marketplace differently. We need to, to um, approach our customers differently. And again, I guess similar to yourselves, from our perspective, our, our inherent knowledge in, in designing the engine, and from the information that engines now develop from, from um, sort of uh, on, onboard sensors that, that we can absorb and we can interpret them a lot more effectively than um, than our uh, customers, um, or we can grow an infrastructure that, that benefits from scale that uh, perhaps our customers can't do. But fundamentally, it has has required us to to uh, have a really philosophical change in, in what what we're doing. So, previously, OEM services are certainly spare parts. That's what I do. And that, that took a long time to get to the point where we were selling you spare parts from when we sold you the engine. So through the 80s and 90s, 
we started developing our, over, our repair and overhaul network. And uh, the next slide will sort of point out where they are in the world. Um, then this sort of concept of total care is, um, is really something that um, we probably really started um, embracing in the um, late uh, 90s. And, and uh, it's really looking for us to leverage our OEM, our original equipment manufacturer knowledge, to get into that after-sale market, which is much bigger for us than the original uh, equipment um, sales. And specifically, the, one of the key attractions for, for our customers is we're now pushing in the same direction. We no longer make money when they have problems. We make money when they don't notice their engine because it's just doing what it says on the tin. So, so I say fundamentally, Total Care rewards us for reliability which is the thing our customers want. By, by charging um, a dollar per engine flying hour, Total Care makes reliability and time on wing, which I'll come back to, who a driver for profit for both ourselves and our airlines. So, and I, I guess the, the final, final point around this, again, it, it stops airlines having to be experts in um, plane engines. They don't want to be. They want, they want the same sort of device. They want the iPad that I just turn on and it works. I, I press a few buttons. It's intuitive. I don't have to do anything clever. I don't need to employ a vast array of engineers to think about how I manage my engines because somebody else does that. Somebody who who, um, who hopefully has a better depth of knowledge, has a much um, deeper um, pool of um, resource, both in assets and um, knowledge, such that I don't actually need to have people on call 24 hours a day because I have a service provider who I can phone at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'll get through to engineers, not, not just a, a skeleton stuff, somebody answering the phone but actually engineers who understand the engine in real depth. So developing the infrastructure, uh, uh, the um, wiggly line along the uh, bottom in time talks about um, specific facilities that we've um, created. Uh, for some reason we decided that Hazel was a um, good, good name for um, facilities, so Hazel is um, based in Hong Kong and is a, uh, is a joint venture. Tazel is out in um, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, which um, again is another joint venture with um, American Airlines. Data Systems and Solutions was again a joint venture, not with an operator this time, but a, a third party. Sazel is in Singapore for or um, base a joint venture. Um, we developed our operations centre, so that's um, a 24-hour a day service. Um, I think if you try phoning it on Christmas Day, you might get through to a mobile phone rather than somebody sat in an office. But that's about it. So we we cover. You can get through and speak to an engineer any day of the week, any time of day or night. Um, unusually, we have a facility not, not called um, an ASL N3. It's an overhaul facility, um, a joint venture with uh, Lufthansa. Um, OSIS is, is where we um, bought out our, um, our joint venture partnership with um, Data Systems and Solutions. So that's now wholly owned. We brought that engine um, health monitoring capability in-house. We saw that as a key key um, part of our business model and there is an expectation that go, going forward we'll have another easel somewhere somewhere in the world as our business has uh, grown. Um, and you can see the, the growth in the um, top half of this in terms of um, how, how much coverage, how much flying is done. So we went from a, a, uh, I'll say a, a slow start in the sort of mid 90s to rapid increase where we'll have 80, 90, 
operators around the world flying that total care and care model with millions of flying hours. And I guess part part something that I perhaps should have touched on in the uh, the previous um, slide. Um, American Airlines is a um, is a total care operator for us, and um, when we signed that total care was when. Texas Aero Engine Systems Limited, TASEL, was created. Interestingly, their Boeing um, 777 aircraft, their biggest departure point is nowhere in the US. It's London Heathrow. So they have a real problem. They have so many departures from London Heathrow, but they don't have a physical presence there. So it's really incumbent on us as a service provider to make sure in the unlikely event they have a disruption in um, Heathrow, Rolls-Royce will be there. Rolls-Royce support will turn all of their flights out of Heathrow, which um, I'll say is key to their, their business. I'll say something like 30% of, uh, of American Airlines 777 departures are from Heathrow or American Airlines doesn't exist in terms of a, um, a support um, function. So, it's a timeline in terms of um, services. So, I guess, um, whilst I don't like to, I will suggest that um, our competition do has, has uh, followed this model. Um, so, General Electric, Pratt & Whitney, they have comparable, although obviously not as good, services uh, out there. Um, but they have really trailed, and not only do they trail in terms of the specific services, but also in terms of their coverage. I believe they have nowhere near the coverage of um, services compared to their original um, equipment um, um, manufacturer. Now, it's worth saying in the night, uh, we, we haven't kept still, I've talked about the basic total care um, model, but we have, we've done, we continue um, to develop and I guess some, some things very similar to what I've um, heard relating to the um, marine business and, and indeed we, we develop the um, service and I guess uh, uh, an example that perhaps um, you can uh, relate to, fuel partnerships is something that we've um, very much started focusing on developing in um, yeah, the, um, the cost of fuel has gone up in our industry as well and quite often you hear airlines talk about fuel being something like 40 or 50 percent of their total um, cost so there's a real a real interest in controlling that cost now they can't they can't influence the price but clearly then they'll look to influence um, um, how they use their engine in, to um, burn less and really we would we would look to um, facilitate that by offering services analyzing how they're using the engines give them advice on uh, how they might use their engines differently we perhaps sell them services to go and clean the inside of their engines which makes them more efficient um, we will um, yeah, we will offer many services like that. We will also offer a upgrade for engines. So um, the Trent um, 900 that I work in is just about to um, release a uh, a new package to um, to um, put into um, the core of the engine. Which uh, one of the prime deliverables is to, is to improve fuel burn and, um, through the life cycle. So again, that's something that. Uh, our customers want and we, we have an opportunity to sell them focusing on their um, cost burden. Okay, I'm going to have a go at uh, give, you, give you a rest from my voice and see if I um, can get a, a, a video to um, play that very much talks about um, services. be 
be fair, I didn't give them any warning I was going to show a video uh, until I arrived this morning, so... Uh, uh. National security and operational readiness. Powering cities across the world. Global trade. Global travel. Our customers rely on us every minute of every day, just as their customers rely on them. In all sectors, our customers have very clear requirements. Availability, reliability and world-class services to support their equipment and their operation. Services that are informed and timely, professional, predictable and planned. Services that are integrated with the customer's operations. As our customer's first choice, our customers have a quite remarkable view of how we support them. How we operate in tune with their own heartbeat. Mission critical services require world-class customer focus and customer relationships. For Rolls-Royce customers, there is more. We're utilizing our unique expertise as the original equipment manufacturer. By doing so, Rolls-Royce is able to innovate, differentiate, and deliver our services far more effectively. In all sectors, we have invested globally in service delivery centers, operations centers, business centers, and data centers. Resource has been applied to deepen our understanding of the customer operations, the behavior of equipment in service, and to develop enhanced ways of maintaining and repairing equipment throughout its lifetime. New innovative services continue to be created, such as new technical and logistics services, and services to support fuel and emission management of equipment. We have created a world-class service model where our customers and customers' customers share our quiet confidence. Whatever it takes, whatever we have to do, we make sure that every day for the customer is just another day at the office. In a sense, remarkable, but just another day. So yeah, unashamedly, uh, obviously a marketing uh, video there. But um, I guess it is, it, it does all um, fit into um, um, what, what's um, important um, to us as um, for our business. I wasn't expecting to have music uh, in the background. <laughs> risks and security we've really um, talked about um, or touched upon these um, maintenance cost guaranteeing the maintenance cost to our operators some of our operators it's even more important to in uh, some parts of the uh, world we'll find um, the fact that um, companies can't spend a huge amount of money without um, ministerial approval so actually paying small amounts every month suits them so rather than try and convince a minister to sign a check for for um, tens of millions in one go every um, every year actually you, uh, you, you bring the um, the level of individual invoice down and that suits them as well um, engine availability the uh, operational performance we we take that away by making sure that we only make money when they're making money. Asset value. Well, th this, um, this is um, really one of the key things. People who we sell engines to 
um, are typically the airlines that you'll recognize around the world, the, the sort of flagship carriers. They, they will uh, typically um, own an aircraft for, uh, or lease an aircraft for 10 years, um, perhaps 15 years, and uh, they will then look to sell it on. And actually, now part of the value in the asset is the fact that it has been operated under total care because the leaser or the person who's buying the engine next says, I know how this has been maintained. It's not been um, cost the cheapest overhaul to push it over the line or anything else. Uh, it's very public that we have a very credible maintenance um, regime behind it. And therefore, that increases the residual value of that asset, that, which uh, is really, uh, I'll say, a key part of the, um, I'll say, the, uh, the value of the um, product, both at buying and then um, perhaps um, selling. Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the other things that where some of this actually further supports our um, business um, model is um, actually protection for us in the aftermarket world. Um, you can imagine some of the parts inside that engine are pretty expensive and um, there's a, um, a great deal of interest in copying the parts which may be a lot cheaper than actually um, designing them new and launching a whole brand new engine like um, we have to do. Um, and really, um, by putting um, engines in a total care program, we actually erode the market's business case for developing alternative um, um, parts. So actually that starts reducing the um, competitive threat to us from people making what um, I might um, call uni parts, so things that um, yeah, threaten our long-term um, business case for um, selling components. So, the total care summary, and I will go on to a bit more of um, the uh, some of the um, technical things. What what sort of things does a uh, assistant chief life cycle engineer do? What what drives my thinking? So, who um, fixes engineering? engine maintenance costs, it aligns business um, structures, increases aircraft availability. Bear, bear in mind that um, an aircraft's value is measured in hundreds of millions and taking that asset out of service for your cheap eight, eight million um, pound parties makes you really unpopular really quickly. You can imagine that um, airlines really look to reduce the size of their um, um, exposure to buying these big capital assets. Increased availability means they can fly more, own less assets. Um, it allows airlines to concentrate on what, what's important to them, which of course is flying people and parcels around the world. Um, and fully transfers financial risk. If our product does not perform the way that the way it's advertised, we feel the pain, not them. So for an operator, they want to take our, our engine that's probably um, spinning at 10,000 revolutions per minute with its, uh, with its some of its um, hottest um, parts, uh, hotter than the surface of the sun. Um, and indeed the metals inside that are probably operating a couple of hundred degrees hotter than their melting um, point and they want to just put them on the wing and um, perhaps five, six, seven years later take it off again as a plug and play um, device which is obviously a challenge as they're probably using it for 14 hours a day now I've not done the sums but that's probably something like 40,000 yeah, hours between overhauls where the operator wants it to be boring, the, the, um, yeah, the part of the engine that they don't notice because it just happens every day. Um, for us, it's worth saying we, we now sell our service um, ahead of actually designing the engine. Our next um, engine to go into service 
is um, the Trent XWB, which is about a year away from entering um, service. Um, we, we have sold um, something like um, 13 or 1400 engines, um, pretty much all of them with um, total care contracts or at least in you know, negotiations to sell those contracts. And we sold those before we started designing the engine. So we, we've got a massive um, amount of our, um, our business model is geared towards this. It's the expectation. We clearly need to make sure that the design of the XWB does what it says on, on our business model. Make sure we're not hideously exposed because all of that is business risk to us. And indeed, the, um, the amount of sales is actually growing our business massively. We are probably um, looking at um, doubling, if not tripling, the volume of new engines that we put out of the door, or sort of going from where we might have put out an, an engine, what, um, two or perhaps three times a week, we will be putting out an engine every day, which is a, a massive change for us, reflects on a massive amount of risk, all of these have total care contracts. If it goes wrong, we need to pick up the pieces. So we have massively bought into this and we've taken on a massive amount of um, risk betting our product will do what it says. So this, this will um, talk a bit more about um, what are the uh, technical um, contributions and this is um, um, a lot closer to um, the sort of things that I do every, every day. Um, as say, I am uh, I'm an engineer by training, and the, these are the sort of uh, I picked uh, six six tags for what what's really important to us. And um, I'll go on to talk about um, two or three of them um, around um, what we do, why they're important to us. But probably um, what I should have put in the middle. Is the, um, is the word maturity, and it is something that we as a business talk about a lot more. We have maturity reviews of the Trent 900, how long the engine's been in service for six years, and we're not at the point where the business case is being met from our perspective. Our, our operators are happy, they're getting the support they need to do their business, yet yeah, we're not meeting yet what um, we wanted the product to do on day one and that, that does erode the basis of taking um, um, revenue on our product. So maturity is from day one doing what the, our business ex expectation is and we're working, we're still working to shorten the time it takes to get to maturity. Design service. Okay, th this has really um, required a change in our mindset. So traditionally, our, our key attributes in um, an engine were weight, fuel consumption, unit cost, and delivery on time. I don't mean the individual engines as we produce them, but actually making sure that we had an engine to hang under the um, wing of the first aircraft that um, is meant to be delivered to our customers. We had to, to um, do that. You do not want to delay, cause a delay for an aircraft entering service. You're, you can imagine there's Airbus and Boeing in, out there. You'll recognize the names and that's about it. If you cause a delay, the, the damage that it does reputationally to you as an engine manufacturer is just unacceptable. Um, but to those traditional attributes, we now need to add time on wing, our life cycle cost, and I might blend those together and call it um, endurance. So the engine lasting and affecting our business case. And an indication of how much we're committed to um, do that. The Trent 900 is hopefully currently um, turning and burning, as we say, in um, our facility in Derby, where we intend to burn approximately a million pounds worth of aviation fuel to demonstrate 
predict um, how an engine lasts, how long it will last, how it will decay by just turning it up, turning it down, and we'll do that for something like two or three months, accelerating um, our products. I, but I say we've committed a million pounds just to demonstrate that endurance capability. And uh, yeah, that's, that is something that traditionally we didn't do. Um, in terms of testing engines, we just had to demonstrate they would work for 150 hours, which kind of seems quite a short time. That meets our regulations, but of course 150 hours isn't, uh, isn't really what um, makes a good business case for us. We're looking at uh, 40,000 hours, not 150. So taking those um, different attributes has been has been hard for us. They're not terribly easy to measure on, on day one. You can imagine things like weight. Well, I, I can work out how much my engine is going to weigh because I've got all these clever um, um, modeling techniques where I can say this is how much it's going to weigh. Um, fuel consumption. Well, when I test an engine, I can work out whether, whether I've met that. Um, but in terms of how long will the engine last on wing, that's really hard. And we find our operators use our engines in the most unexpected of ways and many ways to try and it seems to shorten the life on them on wing. So um, you can imagine um, if you're flying your aircraft in and out of places like um, Dubai, aircraft engines really don't um, like sand inside them and they uh, start um, blocking cooling features in the engine because that, that's the sort of um, scale you see. So it's a really a challenge to us on how we actually flow down our requirements for time on wing. So man who's designing a particular blade, bolt, disc, anything else, how do I communicate to you? I want your bit to last this long on wing. And once I've told you that, how do you do it anyway? Because there are some things that are so relatively easy, you know, sort of stress analysis, crack uh, propagation, etc. But it is, um, yeah, a, a, a not a well understood thing, and is um, really fairly um, ambiguous, and is uh, something that people don't like to do because it's hard. Um, we picked up tools um, from other uh, parts of the industry, um, which. Um, design failure mode um, effect and analysis, which um, we're um, yeah, still really trying to embed and communicate how our engines perform back to um, our designers. So I'm going to quickly touch upon um, time on wing. Um, this is key to us really on the basis that um, this is how we take profit. So every year, you can imagine we might gain a few million from um, our operator for every engine they're flying, and we get to keep that money, hopefully, for the next six years when then, um, that engine that they've given us the money for comes into shop. And we will take profit today from that money, assuming that we will only spend money in six years' time, not spend it in three years' time because the engine came off early. Um, that obvious. Obviously, it's entirely legal in accounting world, but um, we clearly need to make sure our predicted time on wing actually um, meets our, um, our business requirements. It's a lagging indicator, so you don't know whether you really have it and, until your engine tells you, and that's a massive challenge for us. Um, and the other thing is, um, of course, um, most of the techniques we use are statistical, so if I'm planning to have 200 overhauls this year, that'll be plus or minus 20%, and that 20% is I've had to buy parts for it, plus or minus 20%. So I need to make sure I can be both precise and accurate on my time on wing, purely because I can't afford to get it wrong. Some of the parts I use have 18 month lead times, so if I get it wrong, there won't be the parts on the shelf that I need to um, put back into the engine to return the asset to um, customer. So I think I have one or two um, um, moments left, and I will um, talk about. Um, shall I talk about? Okay. So 
going forward, we're looking to, um, for our, our, our service development is concentrating on um, targeting continuing areas of conflict with, where our business model doesn't match our operator. Um, so really they're not a threat to our operator's um, business tomorrow, but actually um, uh, make sure we're in alignment with them. Um, I would say you need to understand the biggest levers in your new service um, structure for us that is time on wing. That is something that we're looking to really, and I probably spend and two or three days a week just worrying about time on wing, doing stuff on time on wing. So really for yourselves, when you, operate, when you spot those key levers, because that, that's really probably the single most act, powerful attribute for our profit and loss on our services, is spot it, change your organization so it focuses on it, my role in Rolls-Royce is new, we have changed organisationally. Um, my role's only existed for um, the last 10 months, so whilst we talk about the fact we've had this service for a long time, organisationally we're still changing to make sure that um, we work towards what's now important to our business, not what's traditionally been powerful to our business. So, I'd say the move towards services, has changed and saved Rolls-Royce. We have bankrupted ourselves in the past on our traditional model. That does not work. We need to change, we need to evolve, and we'll continue to evolve going forward. And I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Thanks.